this video, I'll present a demonstration on how to get started programming an x86 assembly for the MS-DOS operating system. We'll use NetWide Assembler and DOSBox X as our tools for doing this. This is not really a tutorial on x86 assembly language, but more on how to set up an environment and get started programming an assembly for DOS. MS-DOS was originally released in 1981 and saw development until the year 2000, making it 22 years since the last release as of this recording. It is largely unrecognizable compared to modern mainstream operating systems. Why would anyone want to program MS-DOS, some might ask. Well, maybe you are nostalgic for some of the thousands of DOS games released over its life cycle. Maybe you are interested in some of the many popular peripherals from this period, or the architecture of the IBM PC and its descendants. For me, it's a combination of all of the above and more. DOS runs on x86 processors primarily in real mode, giving us access to a 20-bit, 1 megabyte address space. Here we have complete access to all addressable memory and I.O. For those of us interested in low-level programming for x86 computers in general, DOS hits a sweet spot. It gives us complete access to many peripherals and just enough convenience over the BIOS so that we don't have to write our own bootloader, file systems, and basic memory management routines. In this demonstration, we'll assemble a Hello World program into an executable COM file. Then we'll run that file in an emulated DOS environment. If you have any questions about the procedure, just leave a comment, and I'll try to help. There are a few things we'll need before we can get started. Since we'll run our assembled program in an emulator, a host computer is required on which to run both the assembler and the emulator. A GNU Linux, Windows, or Mac OS host should be fine for this. To write source code, we'll need a text editor. I'm going to use Cocoon for this. We'll also need a hex editor to disassemble and analyze the assembled program. I'm going to use the hex dump utility. Finally, to assemble and run our code, we'll need both an assembler and a DOS environment. The assembler is the program we'll use to transform our assembly language source code into the CPU's native machine language instructions. There are many assemblers available with different strengths depending on your application. In this demonstration, I'll use NetWide Assembler, or NASM. I chose NASM because it is still maintained and distributed under a free software license, making it widely available. Also, builds are available for GNU Linux, Windows, and Mac OS systems, so anyone running a mainstream operating system can follow along with the demonstration. Either download a pre-built NASM binary from the website, linked in the description below, or install it from your operating system's package manager. In this video, we'll run DOS inside an environment on our host computer rather than directly on hardware. There are several alternatives here. I'm going to use DOSBox X. DOSBox X is an x86 emulator with a DOS environment inside it. Packages are available for many GNU Linux distributions, and pre-built binaries are available for Windows and Mac OS on the DOSBox X website. If for some reason you can't install DOSBox X, it's fine to use the original DOSBox program instead. The steps to run our Hello World program will be exactly the same in either DOSBox or DOSBox X. The websites for both of these programs are linked in the description below. For this demonstration, I'll be working on a GNU Linux host machine. If you are going to follow along and are using a different operating system, you will need to know how to do the same tasks on it instead. At this point, we've installed our text and hex editors of choice, the NetWide Assembler, and either DOSBox or DOSBox X. With all the one-time setup out of the way, now we're ready to write assembly code. We make a new working directory where our program will live. Then we make a new file called hello.asm inside the working directory. We can add our assembly language code to this file. First, we use the section directive to start the text section. The text section contains our executable code. We start the text section with the org directive. This directive tells the assembler to assume the program is loaded at the given memory location. Because DOS loads COM files at address 
100 hex. That's what we use here. We move the address of the string to print into register DX. We're going to label the address of the string with the name hello when we declare it in the data section at the end of the program. Because we're going to label the string, we can use the name of the label here instead of writing the numeric memory address. We move the integer 9 hex into register AH. The interrupt invoked in the next instruction will read this value and know that we want the display string service to write a string to the DOS console. Now we invoke interrupt 21 hex. This is the interrupt number for DOS services. This instruction transfers control to the interrupt handler, which is what actually prints the string. Next, we move the integer 4C00 hex into register AX. The DOS interrupt handler will use this value to understand we want to end the program. Essentially, this is how we tell DOS our program is finished and transfer control from our program back to DOS. Now we invoke interrupt 21 hex again to actually terminate the program. We're finished with our code, but we still need to declare the string we want to print. We referred to it by the name hello in the first instruction of the program, but right now hello doesn't mean anything to the assembler. We use the section directive to start the data section, which is where we initialize data at assembly time for our program to use. By typing hello followed by a colon, we create a human readable label for the address of the following data. This is why we are able to type hello as the source of the move instruction above. The db pseudo instruction tells the assembler we're declaring one or more bytes of data as opposed to some other size. Finally, the single quotes to limit the beginning and end of the byte string we want to print on the display. The DOS display string routine expects strings to end with a dollar sign character. This is just how DOS knows where the end of the string is in memory. The dollar sign isn't actually printed. We're finished with our program, so we save the file. We assemble the file by running netwide assembler as follows. The first argument to the NASM command is our input file hello.asm. We use the O option to specify the name of the assembled output file. In this case, that's hello.com. Now we start DOSBox X or DOSBox. DOSBox starts at the Z colon prompt. The Z drive is the system drive of the emulated DOS environment. The first thing we need to do here is mount the working directory on our host machine into DOSBox, which we do with the mount command. Now the working directory is mounted as the C drive in DOS. We can change to it with the C colon command, and then list the directory with the dir command. Here we can see the hello.asm file we created, and we can also see the assembled hello.com file. If you don't want to type the mount command every time you start DOSBox, you can add it to the autoexec section of your DOSBox configuration file. Hello.com is a DOS executable file. By the way, the .com executable file extension has been around since the 1970s. It has nothing to do with .com internet domain names. Now we can run the program by running the command hello. The program prints the text hello world and then exits, returning to the DOS prompt. We could have also typed hello.com, but DOS assumes the .com extension, so that's not required. Well, we've done it. We've made an assembly language program and run it under DOS. But let's understand what the assembler actually did for us by taking a close look at the com file NASM generated. Let's use the hex dump utility with the C option to print the contents of the file to a console. We see a series of bytes in hexadecimal representing the machine code and the string data. 
Now let's rearrange those bytes next to the assembly language source instructions, like this. The first number in each row is the address of the first byte of the instruction in memory. The next series of two or three hexadecimal numbers in each row is the machine code that makes up the instruction. The row ends with the corresponding assembly language source code line in hello.asm. The address of the first byte in the program is 100 hex because remember that DOS loads COM files starting at memory location 100 hex. The x86 family has a variable length instruction set, meaning machine code for different instructions can be different numbers of bytes long. So how do we know which instructions are two bytes long and which are three? Compare the listing to this excerpt from the 8086 instruction encoding table. This table shows how every instruction is encoded in machine code. The complete instruction encoding table is in the 8086 CPU user manual, which I've linked in the description below. The table shows that the move immediate 16-bit to register DX instruction is three bytes long. The first byte is BA, and the second and third bytes are the low and high bytes of the data to move into the register, respectively. This matches up with the move DX hello instruction in our program. The first byte is BA, so we know the low byte is OC, and the high byte is O1. In other words, O1 OC hex is the immediate value to move into register DX. Looking at the bottom of the listing, O1OC is the address that starts the string labeled hello in the source file. So the machine code for this instruction is exactly as expected. The next byte in the file is B4. The table shows that the move immediate 8-bit to register AH instruction is two bytes long. The first byte is B4, and the second byte is the byte of data to move into the register. The byte following B4 is 09, and that's the value we chose to move into the AH register. The table excerpt shows the encoding info for the rest of the instructions in the program, too. The hello.com executable file is exactly 25 bytes long, and every one of those bytes either belongs to one of the instructions or the string data in our hello.asm sorts file. From that fact, we can deduce that a COM file contains nothing but machine code instructions and data, and that deduction would be right. A DOS COM file has no header information or other metadata. Well, I hope you enjoyed this demonstration of setting up a development environment for DOS programming, and I hope you enjoyed assembling and running a simple Hello World assembly language program. If you liked this video, I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.